Hey, good morning. Good to see you in the house of God. Who's glad to be in the house of the Lord besides me? Come on, let me hear from you. Hey, thank you, Luke. Hey, you can be seated. As you're being seated, turn to someone next to you. Tell them that you are glad that they are here. While you're doing that, I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online, regardless of which platform, which day of the week you are joining us. So thankful that you're worshiping with us and growing in our faith together. Hey, if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to Romans chapter 12. And some of you might have been expecting Pastor Rich or Hinojosa to step into the pulpit or for me to come and introduce him this morning. And he's, he was really sad that he couldn't be here, but they had a death in the family. Sandra's father passed away just a couple of nights ago. And so they are back in Texas just making the plans to gather the family to remember Sandra's dad. Richard Hinojosa is an amazing man of God, one of the strongest um, preachers and prophetic ministers, I really truly believe, anywhere in the body of Christ. And so he's, he's such a blessing to this church, and he, he care, they care so deeply for you as part of this church family. So they are really sorry that they couldn't be here today, but how many know family comes first? And so we just gladly just, I said, Pastor, I just trust and know that as you guys are staying home this weekend and just doing what you need to do, just gathering your family and remembering her father, that uh, the Lord... Nothing's wasted on God. His timing is perfect. He knows exactly when uh, Pastor Richard needs to be here. I told him, I said, Pastor, I just believe that there's someone that could not or would not be here today that will be here on Sunday, on on, on the weekend of October 30th and 31st. Mark your calendars. That's when they are rescheduled to be here. We'll have a Saturday night evening worship uh, and prophetic ministry time, and then he'll preach on Sunday morning. But I said, Pastor, there's someone that's not going to be here tomorrow or, th- or this, this weekend that will be there on that weekend who needs to hear a word from God that's going to change their life or restore their marriage or get them back on track pursuing and serving and living for God. And so we'll just trust God for that. In the meantime, would you be praying for the Hinojosa family and, uh, and just lift them up and cover them? And so, all right, so let's get into God's word together this morning. And, you know, it's cool because about 10 days ago, Pastor Eddie and I were talking, and he was saying, what are you preaching about this Sunday? And I said, well, I've got two messages to preach to finish the This Means War series, but I've only got one more Sunday in the series. And how many of you know that's kind of interesting that I feel like the Lord actually knew that I would be stepping in on short notice to preach uh, this morning because God just knows. He knows beyond. He knows exactly what was going to happen. And and so I, I told him, I said, I've got two messages to preach, to finish the series, um, one about the battle winning the war in your mind over your thought life, and the other is, was, is winning the battle over your sexual purity. And so this morning, I'm gonna preach to you about winning the battle over your sexual purity. And listen, there's, there's nothing graphic about this message, but I just wanna give you a moment's notice if you're a parent, especially a parent of maybe young children that are in the room with you this morning, that that's the subject uh, topic this morning that we're going to dive into. And again, there's nothing graphic. We're just preaching God's word and reminding people about what God has to say about this important area of life. But if it's something that you would prefer for them not to hear, you're not maybe ready to have some conversations that it could initiate, just want to give you fair notice about that. And there's no judgment if you make that decision. But listen, this, this is an important topic that we really need to be willing to engage in. Uh, This is not just a men's ministry issue. This is not just a youth ministry issue. This is not just a singles ministry issue. This is a church issue. This is a church issue. On average, studies suggest, and this is broadly across our culture, including Christians, one out of six women, including Christians, are addicted to pornography. About half of all men are struggling with addiction to pornography, and half of all teenagers are sexually active. A recent development in the last decade, the largest consumers, this will just make you sad and blow your mind, the largest consumers of online pornography are 12 to 17 year olds. And you just think about what it was like when you were a teenager and then put a device that's instantly connected to the internet and any website you wanna go to in a moment's notice and just imagine what the struggle would be like for you. Listen, if sexual experimentation and exploits were the key to happiness, we would be the most fulfilled, happy, joyful culture that has ever existed. But sadly, we are the most over-sexualized culture ever, and divorce rates are higher than ever. There's a sexual and gender identity crisis, a full-blown crisis. 
And according to the CDC, over 110 million Americans are living with a sexually transmitted disease. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, something's gotta change. Something's gotta change. Here's the good news, here's the good news. Here's the good news. In the midst of all that, here's the good news. God's word still works. And if we will turn from our ways, if we will turn to his word and return to him, he can heal and restore our culture, our hearts, our homes, our families. Someone ought to say amen. Amen. Listen, it would be easier to just avoid this topic. I'm just telling you, there are, are, are more comfortable things that I could develop notes and preach to you this morning. But listen, this, here's the thing, here's why this is important, that we, that we need to dig into God's word, what God's word has to say about this, and be courageous about it, and be willing to get real with God so that we can experience some real, lasting freedom and forgiveness in this area. This is one of the areas that the enemy uses the most to keep people in bondage to guilt, shame, and condemnation. Here's why that's important, because guilt, shame, and condemnation hinder relationships. They hinder your ability to receive and to give in relationship. Here's why it's even more important. We, we, we're t- right there maybe talking about earthly relationships. When people get swept up into sexual sin and there's sin and there's guilt and there's condemnation, most times what the enemy is trying to do is get you to flee from God. To get you to run from God because of the sense or the feeling that you are unworthy and unlovable because of what you're caught up in or because of what your past looks like right from the start, it's the way that the devil came and began to operate with Adam and Eve who lived in a perfect paradise in perfect unity with God. And and the enemy shows up and eventually has them running from God with guilt and, and shame and condemnation, hiding what God created for them to enjoy. Listen, when you deserve God, you need to understand this. Hear this today. When you deserve God the least is when you need him the most. Stop running from God. When you get real with God is not when he finds out about your issues. He knows what you're going through. He knows the struggles. He knows the darkness. He knows the temptations. He sees the deception that has been perpetrated against you. And when you get real with God, say, God, I'm struggling in this area. God, I need strength in this area. God, would you grace me in this area? It's not when God finds out about the struggle. It's when we begin to apprehend the grace of God to be set free in the struggle. Man, we got to run to God. I'm telling you today, as we, as we dig into this topic, would you open your heart? Would you say, God, in the places where I've experienced some victory in this area, I'm so grateful. I recognize it's not because of anything I've done. It's just your grace, and it's the power of your word and the power of your forgiveness leading me into freedom. But, Lord, in the areas where maybe I still struggle, and maybe some of you today are watching online or maybe occasionally struggling in this area, or some of you might be in full-blown bondage. I believe today that the heart of the Lord, I'm telling you, you need to hear this today. There's not one thing that you could tell me that you are wrapped up in or caught up in or trapped in or have done. Or w- There's not one thing that you could tell me that would convince me that that thing is greater than the cross of Jesus Christ and the power of his mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Not one thing. I'm telling you, I've sat over the years as a pastor with people who were swept into all kinds of stuff. I mean, the stories that I've heard as people have sat as individuals or couples on my couch and they've shared what they're going through and the tears have have flowed and fallen. I'm telling you, I've seen when people will get real with God and turn to him and present their hurting, broken situation, the mess of their life. I'm telling you, when you turn to God, he could turn the mess into a message, the test into a testimony, your trial into a triumph. There's not one thing you could tell me today, not one place you've been, not one place you're going. That's, far, that's beyond the ability of God to reach and rescue, and not just rescue, but restore. Amen. I'm just telling you, you need to have faith today. Open your heart, run to God. Come on, would you pray with me, and I'll pray over you corporately. But right where you are, man of God, right where you are, woman of God, come on, ask the Lord to speak to you, to help you, to heal you, to strengthen you. Come on, let's just begin to pray. Father, that's our heart's desire today. Your word is powerful. Your, word, your, your heart is good. 
And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you see the struggle, Lord. You know that there's an enemy that's been unleashed upon the earth who is, who is working overtime to destroy people's lives and marriages and their health. He's working overtime to keep people hindered or held back from experiencing and pursuing and fulfilling the fullness of what you have in your heart, which is relationship and, and a life of purpose and significance, God. And so today, we open our hearts, Lord, to receive what you desire to do, Lord, in our lives, Lord. For those who need healing, Lord, we thank you that you're gonna heal. For those who need freedom, Lord, we thank you that you're the chain breaker today, God. For those who need fresh hope and faith for the future, Lord, we thank you that that's exactly what you're going to bring because it's who you are. And Lord, we just thank you, Father, in advance for what you're going to do. I pray that every man, every woman, every young adult would leave this room changed because of the power of your love, your forgiveness, and your goodness, the power of your word today, God. We receive it, and we expect, Lord, we expect, we approach you with faith today, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you're going to do a work in our lives, Lord, that postures us and positions us, Lord, to walk in greater levels of victory in this area and in every area of life that's important to you. In Jesus' name. And come on, all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Listen, it's time for the church to rediscover our voice in this area and some other areas. When the church is silent, the enemy will fill the void. And the church has gone silent on some of these issues, and what you see in our culture is the enemy filling the void. Again, the real pandemic is a pandemic of, of gender and sexual identity crisis and of confusion about how to live this out. But listen, let me just tell you, even as we see this happening in our culture, the word of God is so clear, where, great, where sin abounds rather, grace abounds much more. And I'm just telling you, we have not out the cross of Jesus Christ. And there's still hope for you, there's hope for our country. Let's look at what Romans chapter 12 instructs and commands us to do. We were in this passage last week in verse two, we're gonna back up and read verse one and verse two, and just watch how these things might even interconnect and go together. And He says in verse one, he says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because of the mercy of God that's been extended to you and to me, through the cross of Jesus Christ. He says, because of this great work, because of this great thing, because God's rescued you and restored you, he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He's saying, you've been saved by, you've been purchased by a price, the blood of Jesus. And he's saying, now give your life to him. You're going to heaven because of the grace of God, but he's saying, in response, what I'm urging you to do is present your life, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is worship. And he goes on and he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, his perfect will. I want to read it to you from the message translation, which says it this way. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. He says, because of what Jesus did. He said, you're going to heaven. The grace of God is so powerful, you're going to heaven. But he's saying, when you think about the cross, when you think about the price, when you think about Jesus, he says, I wanna urge you, give your life to him, every part of your life. Present your body before him. Present every part of your, your everyday life to him and begin to live for him in response to his mercy. I want to give you some reminders and some encouragements today to help you, to help me, to help us win the battle over sexual purity. Number one is this. God created sex. It belongs to him. Genesis 1 verse 28 says this, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. What's he telling them to do right there? <laughs> Fill the earth and govern it. 
Did you know something? Contrary to popular religious belief, sex existed before sin. I thought maybe a man would have amen that, but I appreciate that. <laughs> I like it. Come on, hey, let's, let's, let's loosen up a little bit today, all right? Come on, this is, this is all right to talk about in church because God created it. Amen. It belongs to God. And you know, this is interesting. I saw this recently in, in, in the Word of God. God is the creator of everything. The only place that the enemy is described as a father is the father of lies. Everything else, he's taking what God created it and he's manipulating it, contorting it, perverting it. But he's the father of lies. He's creative in the, his ability to lie to us and deceive us. And, and it's right from, from, right from the start. It's, it's how he came against Adam and Eve. And it says, Genesis 3, 1, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree, say any tree, in the garden. Did you know that that's not what God said? In fact, it's just the opposite of what God said. God created an abundance. God created this amazing paradise. And God said, you can have it all. He said, there's just one boundary that I want to put around this that's going to protect you. And the enemy came into that place in spite of all the ways that God had connected them and provided for them this amazing paradise of abundance. And the enemy shows up and he begins to say, did God really say? And, and will you really die if you disobey God? Where's, where's the enemy showing up in that cunning, crafty way in your life and saying, did God really say? Did you marry the right person? Just a, just a little text thread with that person really won't, it really won't matter. J just a little time on that messenger app with that old high school flame, that, I mean, that's, he's cunning and he's crafty and he shows up and he just introduces just a little lie. I mean, if he showed up, most of us don't wake up in full-on bondage or in the middle or the throes of an affair. Most of us, just one little lie and deception at a time. And today, I believe that the Lord wants to come and he wants to shine his light on some things. He wants to help you. He, he, he wants to rescue you. He wants to keep you. From, from going any further. He wants to get you back on track. He wants to heal and restore. He wants to extend mercy and grace and forgive. He wants to bring you back into the alignment with his will. God created it. It belongs to him. But what I say often might apply to this as much as almost anything else that I've ever presented this statement in light of, and that's the anywhere where there's power, promise, or potential. And in this case, you can even add pleasure. It's the way that God created it. There's joy that's intended to be experienced through this promise, power, potential, and, and even pleasure. Anywhere where those, those things, you better expect that the enemy is going to show up and oppose. And something that was created for your good, and something that was created for a purpose, and something that was created to be enjoyed, is sadly now the place of many people's greatest pain. And it's time to get back. It's time to turn. It's time to, come on, Jesus said, repent, think differently, turn from some ways that you're currently living for the kingdom is here. The kingdom is near. Righteousness, joy, and peace. Come on, there's, there's goodness to be found here. There's, there's a purpose. There's potential. There's promise to be found here. But we got to get back to what God's word has to say. Which leads us to my second reminder and encouragement to help us to win this battle. And that's that be reminded that God's boundaries bring blessing. God's boundaries bring blessing. Everything in this book, every scripture, every chapter, the old and the new, everything in this book, the things that are easy to comprehend, the things that challenge our minds, everything in this book, the instructions, the warnings, the commands, the exhortation, everything is written for your good. 
Sadly, many people, even the Christian church, has begun to kind of pick and choose the scriptures we like, the scriptures we want, the things that kind of comfort us. And if that's what we do, if that's what we relegate our faith to, then it might feel good, but it won't change you. Jesus is a rock. And most of us, we, we prefer laying on the beach. And when you get up off the beach, the sand looks like you. I'm making a little deeper impression in the sand nowadays than I used to make, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> when you get up off the rock, you look like the rock. And we got to build our lives on the rock. Everything in this book, everything in this book, come on, you need to hear me today, man of God. Everything in this book is intended to protect you and direct you and provide for you and bring blessing into your life. I, 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 I'm a father of four and sometimes more, and I, I, I love to see my kids play, and right now, I'm working in our backyard, and I'm, uh, I'm setting up a playground, and I'm, I'm putting the mulch out to help protect the kids if they happen to fall on something that I've built for them to enjoy. And, and, I'm, and I'm fixing the gate, and I'm doing all kinds of things to the, to the house. I love to see my kids play and laugh and have fun within the parameters and the boundaries that I've established. And when I look out there, we got a little three-year-old guy, and man, he's busy, you know, I mean, he's all over the place. And when I look outside and I see that he wants, I saw him playing over here, but then I look over here and the gate is open. And I know that there's teenagers in our neighborhood, and I know that they zip and zoom up and down our street. I'm just telling you, when I look and I see that he was once there, but now I see that he's no longer there playing in the boundaries that I've created, and the gate is swung open Man, this father's heart. You never seen me drop what I was doing so fast. It doesn't matter. I'm on the phone with you. I'm in the middle of an important email. I'm watching the Dallas Cowboys or the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm out the door. Because I know that this activity, when conducted in the boundaries, brings blessing. But the same activity, running, jumping, whatever it is, when it happens in the street beyond the gates. Maybe there's someone here today and you're, you're testing the gates. Maybe the gate is open. Maybe the enemy has come and he's kind of unlatched your gate and you're looking at the gate. Or maybe some of you are already standing by the curb and maybe a few of us today are already full-blown in the street. And I'm telling you today, regardless, that there's a heavenly father. He's not a prude. He's not a boss. He's not a master. He's not a taskmaster, rather. He's not a slave driver. He's a good father. And he didn't write this book to spoil your party or hinder your fun. He wrote this book to be a, a, a blessing, uh, to provide boundaries, to tell, to tell you this is how I've created you. This is the instruction manual for your life. And if you'll live life, if you'll do marriage, if you'll do sexuality, the way that I created you to experience it, it will bring blessing. But when you begin to deviate or you begin to get outside the gates and you begin to play in the street, there's a, there's a potential that something that's intended to bring pleasure and promise into your life can become a place of your greatest pain. Man, if that's you today, come on, I don't know who I'm preaching to in this room and online. There's still opportunity to go back to that gate and to secure that gate. That's what the Lord wants to do today. There's still opportunity to get out of the street and to go back to the place of God's provision 
to go back to the place where God has created these parameters that are found in his word that allow us to experience and walk in the fullness of God's blessing. Number three. It's embrace grace. If you're gonna win this battle over your life, and it's a battle that we all wage, and it's a battle that, it's interesting to think about the difference between the battle and the war. But wars are always won when you string together victories and battles. And the, the pathway to winning this battle in your life, you've got to embrace grace. I mean radical grace that's unmerited, undeserved. The cross of Jesus Christ is radical. It's radical. It pays, again, there's not one thing that you could tell me that you've done or that you're caught up in or that you're contemplating doing that the cross of Jesus Christ is not greater than that thing. You've got to embrace radical grace. The kind of grace that sets a woman caught in the very act that sets her free and frees her from her accusers. We find that story in John chapter 8. And it's, they say, teacher. They said to Jesus as they were bringing this woman before her, they said, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? Reading on, they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus... Man, who's grateful for a but Jesus moment in your life? Amen. But Jesus stooped. He stooped. The religious spirit was rising up and ready to cast their stones. But Jesus, when he's confronted with the very same situation, he didn't argue about the situation. The religious spirit wanted to rise up and stand up tall and wanted to cast their stones. Jesus stooped down. He stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger, And, and I don't know what he was writing, but I've heard it supposed or proposed that maybe he was writing the names of some maybe he was writing the names of some people that those religious leaders might recognize and say, "How does he know about her?" And it says, they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again. He stooped down again. And he wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Only Jesus. Until only Jesus, until only Jesus, until only Jesus was left. And I, I, I'm just telling you, you could go through some things and, and, and the key to the freedom, the key to the breakthrough, the key to the healing is to get to the place where it's only Jesus. Right. Only Jesus remains. Only Jesus remains. And, 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 and it says, only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, now he's speaking to the woman, the very one who was caught in the act. And he says, where are your accusers? And Jesus doesn't ask a question because he needs the answer. He's trying to make a point in her heart. He knows where they are. He wants to make sure that she knows. For who was the one that can bring a charge against God's elect? No one. Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and that includes you. Yeah. And if it doesn't include you, today is your day. Yeah. And he says, where your accusers didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. You got to embrace grace. This is, a, this is a scandalous kind of a grace. This is a radical grace. This is a grace that forgives when you're caught in the act. This is a grace that forgives. I mean, I'm telling you, even the deepest, the darkest, the dirtiest thing, get, this is a grace that forgives. You got to embrace grace. Grace that compels us to grow. He says, go and sin no more. 
And the kind of grace that we ought to embrace is a grace that compels us to go forward in God and grow differently in God and begin to grow closer and look more like Jesus. That's the kind of of grace that we've got to establish. Grace that causes us to grow. Our church needs to be an environment of radical grace, but not grace that allows people to to stay stuck or stay mired in their current situation or their sin. It's a grace that rescues us to allow us to begin to run a race that God has prepared for us. Grace and growth. You need an atmosphere of grace and growth in your home with your spouse. Do you know if you were able to clearly establish that kind of an atmosphere in your home, maybe we would be more comfortable talking about our issues and our challenges instead of sweeping them under the rug or hiding them in the dark places. And when we sweep them under the rug and we hide them in dark places, I'm just telling you, it doesn't change the reality that those things are there. It just perpetuates the cycle. It keeps us from cutting off the deception of the enemy. How would you respond if your spouse had an honest conversation with you about his or her struggle? What would it look like for you to predetermine based on the reminder that you have about the depth of what you have been forgiven? To say, this might be painful, to forgive, this might be painful, but the nails that went into my Savior's hands were painful too. And he died for this. But Pastor T, what if they don't change 70 times seven? But Pastor T, don't they have, yes, they do have a responsibility to take responsibility. It's not about turning a blind eye to bad behavior. They have a responsibility and we need counseling and we need encouragement and we need accountability. We need need all those things. But I'm telling you, the pathway to really experiencing, that's what Jesus did in this woman's life. He He didn't lecture her or criticize her. He just quickly, radically forgave her. And then he said, now, in light of God's mercy, remember what we read back to the beginning. In light of God's mercy, now go and present your life as a living and holy sacrifice before God. This is your your act of worship before God. In view of God's mercy, we need grace that compels us to grow. Man, I want to know. I want to know more about a God who forgives. I want to look more like a God who's rich in mercy and slow to anger. Come on, someone ought to say amen. amen. Number four, you gotta deal with root issues. You gotta deal with root issues. We tend to focus on the fruit instead of the root. Most times, hear me, people, most times the bottle, the pills, the porn are the fruit of an unresolved root. The anger from your past, the rejection from your past, or the generational sin. This is deep. I, there's a lot in here. I gotta move quickly, so listen fast. Isaiah 61, this is profound. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Someone say good news. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to heal something in the inward places, to proclaim freedom for the captives. Say captives. I know these are not normally the kind of words I call out, but there's a point to be made. And release from darkness for the prisoners. Say prisoners. I used to see this as one concept, but the Lord has shown me that it's two. Captives and prisoners. I don't know about you, but in my life, there's some things that I've actually done, sins I've actually committed, pride that I've actually walked in that actually would cause for me to be deserving of the sentence that was due me. I'm a prisoner. But then there's some other things that have happened in my life that I didn't deserve and I didn't expect and I didn't see coming that were perpetrated against me, that were done in a way that I, I didn't see coming, I didn't see happening, that in some ways the enemy's using those things to cause me to be a captive. Here's the good news. Isaiah 53 says that he was bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. A wound is an outward thing, and it says he was wounded for our transgressions. A transgression is the actual sin. But he was bruised, which is an inward thing for our iniquities, and iniquity is the inward motivation to sin. And the cross of Jesus Christ has dealt with both. The places where you're a prisoner because of the things you've actually done, 
the places where you become captive because of the ways that the enemy has lied or the thing that the person did to you or the abuse or the neglect or the whatever it was. There's some places where I, I, I deserve what, that what was coming to me that Jesus came and paid the price for. But I didn't deserve as a five-year-old kid to have an eight-year-old boy that lived across the little housing complex where we lived in House K, and I don't know what he did, but I know I can still remember when you walk out, it was, it was kind of towards that direction. There was an eight-year-old boy named Sean, and I was a five-year-old boy. When Sean introduced me to my first pornographic magazine, And how many of you know that that's not normal behavior for an eight-year-old? Something had been done to Sean. And I just pray that he found Jesus so that he's no longer a captive to whatever was perpetrated against him that he never, he didn't deserve. So back to the good news. You got to catch this. You got to catch this. The cross of Jesus Christ paid for both. The things we've done and the things that were done to us. He wants to set you free if you're a captive in bondage. He wants, to, he wants to, to set you free if you're a prisoner because of your own bad mistakes. The cross of Jesus has defeated both. You ought to receive that today, and you ought to begin to walk in it today. You got to, all right, moving on. You got to run from sin and run to God. When Paul spoke of sin, he generally said, fight or resist. When he sp spoke of sexual sin, he said, flee. Don't hang around the battleground. Don't hang around those, those, that range of channels in your TV programming. Don't hang around that website. Delete the app maybe you got. I mean, don't hang around that place. The Bible says flee. Isn't that powerful? In most places it says fight or resist, but in this it says don't even get in that battle. I mean, you got to get away from that battle. You got to run from sin and run towards God. And this is one of the most powerful examples of it, to me at least. We find it in 2 Samuel 11. Some of you might be familiar with this, and it's speaking of King David, and it says in verse 1, in the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. And late one afternoon, reading on verse 2, did you guys catch that? He was supposed to be on the battlefield, but he sent someone else in his stead. And he stayed behind. And I'm talking to you about running, flee from sin, run to God, run to God, run to God, run to your purpose in God. Quit just raise the stakes, raise the standard a little bit about what it looks like to be a man of God. We're no longer just struggling in the toil against sin and this and that and the other. We're, not, we're going beyond. We're, 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 we're living our life as kings and priests in our homes and in our marriages and in our church and in our community. Don't stay behind. Begin to run towards God. And, and, and watch what happened. David shouldn't have even been here. Watch what happened. It says in verse 2, late one afternoon after his midday rest. That's just nice language for a nap. He took a nap in the middle of the day. David got out of bed. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. I might do it today. <laughs> it says David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of his palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Come on, who takes a bath on the roof? And it says he sent someone to find out who she was. He was told, she's Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, wife of Uriah. And David sent messengers to get her when she came to the palace. He slept with her. He shouldn't have been there. You got to flee sin. You got you to run towards God. Men of God, you got you to flee sin. You got to start running towards God. Run towards God. I'm just telling you. Run towards God. Run towards God. His purpose, his plan. Start, quit, quit, quit just settling for this mediocre Christian existence and embrace the call that you are called to be a mighty man of God. Does it mean that you won't struggle or stumble? Absolutely not. In fact, that brings me to our last point. We'll land right here. And the last point is embrace grace. But wait a minute, Pastor T. I thought you already made that point. Yes, I did, but you're, you're gonna have to embrace grace again. I just promise you, in this struggle, you're gonna have a lot of wins and occasionally you might have a stumble. You're going to have to embrace grace again. Proverbs 24, 16 says, The godly may trip even seven times, but they will get up again and keep moving and keep going and keep growing. Why? Because of the grace of God. Zechariah 4, verse 6 through 7. This is a powerful scripture. We'll land right here. We're, and, and, and I'm going to give you a moment to allow the Lord to touch your heart and give you an opportunity to respond. 
But verse six, it says, then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. And this is where you might recognize that this is where the scripture comes from. Saying, not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. And watch, reading on it says, what are you, you great mountain, this big thing that seems difficult to overcome, that seems difficult to gain the victory over? He says, what are you, you great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain. In other words, the mountain is coming down. And he will bring up the top stone with shouts of grace, grace. Come on, say grace, grace. Grace, grace. Not one grace, double grace. Grace, grace. Grace, grace. Jesus stooped down again. You say, well, I've already been forgiven, but now I'm still struggling. Jesus will stoop down again. You gotta embrace grace, grace. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Let's respond to the Lord. I wanna give him a chance to set you free today. I wanna give him a chance to strengthen you today. And I wanna pray boldly over some of you today. And listen, if, if you're walking in freedom and victory in this area, would you just support through intercession the work of God that God desires to do in the lives of your brothers and sisters in the room and joining us online today? But I don't wanna put anyone on the spot, but I, I wanna give several different groups of people an opportunity to respond. And so listen, I, here, I, wanna, re, I wanna give you a, 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 an opportunity to respond and just acknowledge to God, Lord, that's me and I need your grace. Lord, that's me and I need your strength. And, and I wanna start with people that you, you're really in bondage. I mean, really, something that started out as just kind of a flirtation or something that started out, you're in bondage to some sort of sexual impurity in your mind or outwardly you're, you're, you're living it out. And listen, if that's you, I'm not gonna ask people to raise their hand or anything. I mean, I, I think God sees and knows in this moment. But if that's you, I want you to present that thing before God in a, with faith and expectation that today is your day for freedom and breakthrough because of the grace of God, because of the power of his love and his forgiveness over your life, because of grace, grace, the double portion of grace that I believe is present in the room today. And so come on, every, every head bowed, eye closed, and I'm gonna pray. Lord, I pray over every person who's in this room or joining us online who would say, I'm really, Pastor T, I'm in bondage. I've become in bondage. I, 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 I kind of started to go there, and now I just, I, I, I'm in bondage, I'm addicted. And, and Lord, I, I declare freedom for the captives, freedom for the prisoners. Right now, in Jesus' mighty name, your word says that we could bind and loose on earth in this life, and it will be done in heaven. And right now, because you've given us that authority, I bind that spirit of lust, I bind that spirit right now in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that there would be freedom and release for the prisoners and the captives today in Jesus' mighty name. The place where the enemy has come and he's lied and he's deceived and he's gotten his foot in the door of, of hearts and homes and marriages, we say not today, we say no more. Say We are turning to God, we are returning to his word, we are receiving his grace today to walk free and to be made new in Jesus' mighty name. And come on, all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, I wanna pray for another group of people. Pray for another group of people. And I, and I, I kinda stopped and ministered a little bit right there, but I wanna pray for people who are looking at an open gate. You're looking at an open gate. I don't know what that looks like for you. It's a text from an old flame or friend or whatever, or it's, you're looking at an open gate. And I wanna ask the Lord to give you a grace to right now, while there's still time to just really just say, I recognize that for what it is and I'm not going there. I don't wanna find myself playing in the street two weeks or two months from now. So let's, let's minister, let's pray for, for those situations. Father, we thank you for today, Lord, just you reveal things so that you can heal things. And you bring conviction, not condemnation. And so, Lord, we thank you that today, Lord, you're shining your light on those gates that the enemy has come and maybe he's pulled the, he's kind of left the latch open so that the gate would kind of swing open with the breeze and we're looking at that gate and I pray today, God, that we would begin to recognize it for what it is, that it's an invitation to step outside the boundaries of your blessing, God. And, and it might look adventurous and it might feel exciting, but I'm telling you, there's pain that is to be found in the street. And, and so I just thank you, Lord, for the grace, God, the grace. Oh, oh, oh my goodness, if that's you today and God is gracing you to go to that place and close that gate and, 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 and put a padlock on it, I'm telling you, you ought to thank God for what he's saving you and rescuing you from on the other side of the gate. And we just thank you for that, God. We receive it today. You're so good. You're such a good father. We receive that today in Jesus' name and all God's people said.
All right, lastly, one more group of people, and that's people who are here and are far from God. And you need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need forgiveness. You need a new start, a fresh start. And if that's you today, maybe you once knew God, served God, were raised in the church, or maybe you, and you've just drifted from him, you're a prodigal son or daughter, maybe you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus and received his forgiveness. Either way or anywhere in between, this moment is for you right now. Don't wait, raise your hand. Just say, that's me, Pastor T. I need forgiveness. I need a fresh start. I need a new life. I need to be washed clean. I need to be made whole. Right now, raise your hand. If you're online, you're joining us and that's you. Don't, don't, don't uh, miss the moment to even pull over to the side of the road or stand up off your couch. You're not responding to a person, you're responding to your heavenly Father. I think it's powerfully important that you would always also take that step of faith. Just lift your hand, lift your hand. One more moment. Thank you, Lord, for these precious people. Thank you, Lord, for, for the hands raised that just are, it's an outward sign of an inward work, what you're doing in their hearts. You can lower your hands and let's pray this prayer together. We do it every week to quickly come alongside people who are coming home to Jesus and just show them there's a church family that wants to, we're in this together. And we do it every week because it reminds us that even as we're growing, we're maturing, and we are, we're going places in God. We're growing in our faith. Come on, men of God, we're not gonna settle for the standards of the world. Come on, women of God, we're, we're, we're going some places in God. We're growing and maturing in our faith, but we recognize that even as we're growing, it's all happening on the foundation of unmerited grace that we can never earn, never deserve. So it reminds us of that every week when we pray this together. Come on, let's do it. Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I couldn't pay to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. And I give you that life. And I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, Come on, say it with a shout, I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. And then rejoice with all of heaven for the people who came home to Jesus. Hey, come on, let's worship the Lord one more time together today. Let's worship him and thank him for what he's done in our lives. Amen.